So um, I get together with my mom often for breakfast and um, random meals. And the other night I was having dinner with her and she had asked a friend of hers, um, would you consider yourself religious? And we got in this conversation. We talk about faith and religion a lot. Um, she's not a follower of Christ, but uh, we got on this discussion and, um, and I said, mom, I'm really uncomfortable with that word. Like, I don't feel very religious myself. She said, what would you call yourself then? You're a pastor. Um, you <laughs> work at the business of religion. And so it, we kind of had this weird thing. But it occurred to me there that, um, that I really don't like being religious. And I'm not sure that Jesus was all that religious too, which is a whole other step that my mom and I were struggling with. Um, and here's what it boils down to. I had to give some thought and some reflection to it, but I think religion is primarily about finding a set of rules, a set of do's and don'ts and behaviors that you're going to live out so that you can keep God happy with you. And that, that was kind of the part of this that I go, man, that doesn't sound like following Jesus at all to me. Um, and then the Bible's role in that would be to uh, be kind of the book that has the list of the do's and the don'ts, and then that's how you're supposed to live in order to keep God happy. Um, and so, I really hope that in coming here, that's not what you find. I hope that you find much more than that, and that in Jesus, you find something much more than that. Um, Harvard Church is, is a place about following Jesus. That's, that's what this church is. Um, and we aren't actually here for uh, religion, because I'm not sure religion is actually life-giving, but Jesus really, really is. And so that's what we're going to kind of get into. We're doing... Um, I was given free reign of whatever I wanted to preach for these two weeks, so I, I picked my favorite text. I did David last week, um, David and Goliath, and then this week we're doing um, John chapter 4, which is the woman at the well. And that story is so integral to me and my faith. Um, it was a big part of how I came to faith 20 years ago as I was reading the book of John on a Saturday and I was struck by this kind of encounter and this invitation from Jesus to something very life-giving. Um, I ended up getting a tattoo over my entire upper arm of a big cross that represents this particular story um, because it means so much to me because in this story is um, the core of the gospel. It's the core of what Christianity is all about. And I think it provides for us a way to move forward. Um, how do we actually live out our faith? How would we go about sharing this faith with our neighbors? All of that is packed into this story for me. So this, this is a personal story. It, it's, it gets real personal with me. Um, and for me, it takes us so far past, like, Christian cliches and bumper stickers and a whole bunch of other things that I go, man, that is, that is not what Jesus is all about. So, um, so we're just going to get into it. Um, I like this woman because she's not religious, and I didn't feel like when I came to Christ, I was religious, and I still struggle with the term, obviously. So, um, here we go. Uh, the woman's story begins in John chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Let me read this for us. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired as he was from the journey, and he sat down by that well, and it was about noon. And when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How is it that you can even ask me for a drink? Because Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So to get what's going on in this, this uh, beginning of this encounter at meeting Jesus, you have to understand some things about the Jews and the Samaritans. So um, there was a ton of uh, racial tension. There was a lot of divide. There was a lot of... Um, of anger at each other between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were in the north, and um, Assyria had come and conquered the northern part of Israel, and uh, that was in 722 BC, and what Assyria did in order to stop uh, people from revolting was really smart. What they did was they kind of repopulated the area with people from all over, so they would deport most of the people of a place that they conquered, send them all over the entire empire, bring in a bunch of people from other places and settle them all here. And what you get is basically like America, a big melting pot. And what people would do is go, well, I guess I'm not in my home country anymore. And so I'm primarily, I guess, Syrian now. And that was kind of their identity. And so it, uh, it kind of stopped the revolts. And uh, whereas the southern part of Israel 
they had been conquered as well, but they didn't get repopulated uh, to different places uh, in the same way. And so they had this strong sense of kind of national pride, um, the sense of like, we are Jewish and that's all we are and we don't marry outside of our nation. And uh, and so those folks up there, they're just half it. It's kind of that kind of perception. Um, they had a series of clashes. They'd had uh, a lot of distrust and fear built up. And so the closest thing I can think of is like modern day Palestine and Israel. Uh, those folks are, are just waiting for something to explode or imagine the civil rights movement and Jesus is sort of like a rich uh, white guy in the middle of a dirt poor southern black neighborhood. And you go, man, this could go sideways so many different ways. Um, and not only that, but in Jesus' culture, uh, a Jewish man, especially a rabbi, would never even think to speak to a woman to ask her for a drink let alone a Samaritan woman, and if she gave him the drink, he probably should reject it because that would make him unclean to drink from her pitcher and from her giving him this. Um, it, was, it was scandalous for Jesus to even talk to her. Um, and yet, it says that Jesus had to come here, and it isn't geographical. He had to come here. He had to come here. He had to meet these people. He had to share the good news with these people. Um, and so they're expecting religion out of this Jewish rabbi, and what they find is, is this relationship that he strikes up with them. And I can picture this woman kind of coming to the well. She comes at noon. It's hot. It's grueling. That's not when people normally go get their water because it's kind of dangerous to go out alone, and, and you don't want to be there in the heat of the day. And um, as she's hoping for her moment of solitude, there sitting at the edge of the well is a Jewish rabbi of all people. And I think that she's honestly sitting there going, man, I hope he just doesn't talk to me. And she has a whole story on why she wants to be there alone. Uh, in verse 17, we find out that she has had five divorces, and she's living with a guy she's not married to now. And in a culture where you're basically judged on who it is that you married, um, and not to mention that, why has she gone through so many Husbands. There's there's things that are wrong uh, relationally in in her life right now, and um, she would rather go through the heat of the day. She would rather go through the grueling task of of getting water in the heat of the day than deal with the whispers of the people that she should be looking to for support. Um, she doesn't like the sideways glances. I mean, she is isolated on purpose in this moment. Um, now, my point of all this is that uh, she's not all that different from us. Uh, she's, she's got some brokenness. She's got some damage. And she's got some stuff in her life that she doesn't want everybody to know. And I think that's probably true of all of us. Um, and if Jesus were to speak up to her, she's probably hoping he doesn't, but if he were to speak up, and especially if she were to know his story, it's probably going to end in being judged and being shamed and being rejected. My mom, as I told you, is not, uh, she's not a Christian. She's gay. She's um, been gay for a very, very long time. And um, and I remember when I became a Christian at 19 and a half, and then I told her that I felt called to go into ministry and start looking into Bible schools. We had this sit down, and she looked at me, and with tears in her eyes, she said, does this mean you're going to never talk to me? Which I thought was absolutely crazy. I'm like, you're my mom. Why would I not talk to you anymore? And, but there was some part of this identity of being gay that, that meant Christians don't want to be with you. They don't. They're going to reject you. Um, and then I had a friend in Bible school who, uh, he, was, he had a real heart for youth ministry. He was really, really, uh, really, really gifted kind of as a counselor. And, um, and he decided somewhere along the way that... Uh, that he, he was gay as well, and he was struggling with this in Bible school, so he went and talked to his professor, and his professor said to him, throw over my dead body, let me know if you get a degree from the school that will let you work with children who are gay in this. And I thought, wow, how did this come up? Because this doesn't look very much like Jesus anymore. Um, so there's something that has gotten sort of off track, and this story has kind of helped me get back to what it was to have something on track because um, this woman's encounter with Jesus leads her to a place that uh, is really powerful. I'm going to read the ending of the story. We're going to kind of do one of those jump forwards that they do in TV shows sometimes. 
Um, so this is verses 28 through 30 and 39 through 41. After this woman encountered Jesus, this dialogue that they had, the woman went back to town. She went back to those people she was avoiding and said, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town, and they made their way towards him, and many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. He told me everything I ever did, and yet he's offering me something. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he did stay for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. Um, for him to stay with them was scandalous, too, and yet there he was with them. Um, and obviously what they received from him was not kind of a punch in the face, a stiff arm of religion. What they received was really a relationship and a richness of encountering God. So how did this woman who's expecting a bad religious experience um, become the evangelist to a whole region of people? How did she become the very first person to go, you've got to meet this guy Jesus because he is absolutely phenomenal. Um, what about Jesus was so compelling and so transforming? Um, by the way, my niece has been asking me some questions about God, and neither of my brothers are Christians either or, or religious in any sort of way, and so they have a tendency to tell their kids to come talk to me. Um, <laughs> um, I'm also a professional religious guy. <laughs> Not religious. <laughs> so anyways, she's coming to me and asking me these questions and immediately going into like the moral issues involved with Christianity and how could the Bible say this or that? And I said, do me a favor, like read about Jesus and tell me if you find him interesting enough that you want to read about him. Because that's really what's at the core of this thing is this Jesus thing. Um, and there's a couple of things that I think surprise people when they get looking at Christianity. It surprises Christians sometimes. And, and the first is that um, Jesus is not primarily talking about a moral platform. Um, and the second is that he's not primarily talking about religious duties. And that's what I think um, opens the door for this woman. Um, let me read for you the first part of this woman's conversation when Jesus asks her for a drink. And uh, she says, well, why are you even talking to me? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I don't have to keep coming back to this well because I'm thirsty. And the conversation right here is about an invitation. Jesus is saying, you know what? You could ask me and I would give you living water. It's about receiving living water, which is a metaphor for, for life. It's about an abundant life. Um, but what about these, these morals? I mean... Does she have to be a good person for this to, to happen? And so Jesus brings it up. He says, you know, go, go call your husband and then come back. Bring him. It'd be great. I have no husband, she replied. Um, and Jesus said, where well, you are right, you have no husband. In fact, you have five husbands. And the man that you're with is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. And this woman said, sir, I can see that you're a prophet. <laughs> Here's what I love about Jesus in this conversation. He says, I know you. I know your story. But he doesn't seem to find a soapbox. He doesn't uh, get on it and say, well, here's how you should be living. Um, instead, he says, you know what? I have this gift for you, a gift of life for you that I would like you to have. As I said, we all kind of have um, the stuff that we don't want anybody to know. And um, I know that when Jesus said, well, go get your husband, she's like, ah, oh, shoot. Dang it. Why do you have to bring that up? And she, she goes with the whole, let's just keep the answer short. And I know when I would come home from school as a high schooler, I would like, hey, here's my day. And I'd talk to my mom about it. And we'd, we'd dialogue about all the stuff that I learned. And I knew when I had done something wrong, all of that changed. Because I came home and she's like, how was your day? Good. <laughs> so what'd you do when you spent the night at your friend's house? Well, 
not as much, but I'm really tired of this relationship. Like, just go to sleep right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't make eye contact, everything kind of shifts down. And, uh, and, and she goes, you know, I don't know how to spend it. like that. And Jesus says, well, I, have, I know more than that short answer you're giving me. Um, but the beautiful thing is that he doesn't say, hey, by the way, this whole thing that I'm spreading, this Christianity thing, it really promotes uh, marriage as kind of a, a one-time deal, and you have five of them, so let's let's sit down and talk about that. He doesn't like he doesn't get sidetracked by the morality and let that get in the way of giving life. Here's the essence, I think, of what she got when she encountered Jesus and why she could go tell everybody, and the heart of what she told them is. Here's a man who knew everything I ever did. What she got was, I know you, I know your story, and I love you. That is powerful. That is beautiful. And that means that even though she wanted to hide, she found somebody who knew her, and she encountered love and acceptance and an offer of life. John 3.16, most important scripture you could ever probably learn. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And for some odd reason, we don't always quote 17 with it, and I wish we did. 17 is actually the most powerful part of it, and it says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through him. God's methodology of transforming lives is this. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to love you. Let me in, and then let's see what happens. Because transformation happens when you receive the love of God. Jesus doesn't transform by pushing a moral agenda. He transforms by saying, you're loved. I want the most for you, and I want to change your life. Now, I know that for most of us, um, we get that. Most of us don't go stand on corners. We're not like the guy at my nephew's graduation who was standing there with a megaphone in his turn and burn uh, giant sandwich board over his shoulders yelling at all of these high school students how they need to repent. Um, but I think it does come through in some subtle ways. Um, it's interesting to me that Christians sometimes associate with some people but refuse to associate with others. Um, it's scary to me that uh, even in church, it's easy to build a facade and to not confess sin to one another because we really do worry what people will think. They might reject us if they know. Um, I see it in Christians when I talk to them about what they think is God's primary, primary view of their life. And I hear so many times, I think God's probably pretty disappointed with me. Where would you get that? God loves you. It says, as his beloved child, that's what the scriptures say. And yet somehow we know that we haven't lived up to the great love of God, and so we take it as, well, God's probably pretty disappointed. Um, you know when a kid screws up, I've talked to a lot of parents, I don't have kids, I wish I did have kids, but that's part of my story. But uh, when a kid screws up, I have not talked to very many parents, I don't think any parents actually, who have ever said, man, what a disappointment. What a failure of a son. Uh, I'm thinking that I should probably just get rid of him and disown him because he probably didn't measure up to my uh, standards that I had set for him. What I do hear almost every time is this. Man, I love him. Man, I want him to thrive. And, and I would do anything for him. And, and what I want most of all is for him to know that he's loved. And then, um, I, and I would love to see some thing, things change in his life because I think that he would actually be um, and that's where the moral component of Christianity comes in. God loves us so much that he doesn't say just stay as you are. He says, I got more for you. I got something better for you. But first of all, I just want you to know you're loved. <clears throat> if our faith boils down to a set of do's and don'ts and a moral standard, um, we're going to miss it. We're going to absolutely miss the love of God. It's going to get choked right out of us. And then when we actually try to share the love of God with other people, what they're going to hear is 
here's what you should be doing if you really want to keep God happy because it's already been choked out of us so we can't even begin to share it with somebody else. The other thing that this woman discovers is that um, we're not talking about a set of religious practices. Verses 19 and 20. This lady says, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. You know, our, our ancestors worship on this mountain. And you Jews say we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem, and, and nobody really knows the answer except the Messiah, and he's going to come. And so we obviously have our different perspectives. That's kind of what I hear saying. And um, the Samaritans uh, looked at some of the earliest times of worship in the Bible, and they said, you know, let's let's worship on Mount Gerizim. It's, it's in our territory, and, and there's a good history of worship there. And the Jews said, you know, no, God has given us this temple, he has built this temple, and um, he wants us to go sacrifice animals there to keep him uh, happy and pleased with our lives. And by the way, I'm so glad I'm a pastor in this area, because I don't think I can handle the whole, like, all right, bring the goat, it's time for worship. <laughs> yeah, let's just, we're never going there, God, I'm sorry, not, gonna, not even on, like, Old Testament Sunday or something. <laughs> But here's what Jesus says back. Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, because salvation came through the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they're the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit. Worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Talks about connecting with God on a spiritual level. He says, you know, you could worship here, and you could worship down there, but if you really want to worship, the worshipers that the Father is looking for now are people that will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Um, it's not about a list of checkboxes. It's not about getting the right place and doing the right things. And um, it's really easy for us, especially for good list makers, to make a checkbox sort of list out of what it means to be a good Christian. And uh, there's, well, it was Sunday, and I, I found a ministry at the church, and, and I give a little bit. And then um, I've been around it long enough that I found out about this thing called quiet time, so I do that every morning, and it's exactly one hour, and it's supposed to be broken down into 10 minutes of prayer, and then 30 minutes of scripture, and then 10 more minutes of prayer for other people, and then there's a specific way that we can do this prayer, and we, we get these check boxes for everything, which is kind of crazy making. Um, but somehow at the end of the day, if we check off all the boxes, we go, man, I'm right on track. I'm doing good. Um, and checkbox religion uh, does all the right things, but it does it not for the right reasons. All those things can be really life-giving. Coming here, I think, is a really life-giving thing to do. That's why I keep doing it. Um, finding a ministry in the church gives you an outlet as a way to say, I love God back. Um, there's all these things that we do that, that are great, but if they're just done out of a sense of ought to and should, that's the words that pop up in my faith. And in, in, when I know that things have gotten off track, well, I ought to have been doing this better. Um, then I go, man, it's starting to sound like duty. And duty is a really scary place for a relationship. Um, if I go to Christina and I go, hey, honey, look, I've got you flowers. And she goes, oh. How oh, sweet. That's so nice of you. And I say, well, it's my duty. You know, it's the husband thing to do. Isn't there like a three-month sort of thing, and then once I get past that date, there's like penalty charges, and I have to like, uh, it's my duty, so take them. <laughs> that doesn't build relationship. It feels off when, when that happens. But then on the other hand, if I go, man, I appreciate how much Christina loves me, so I'm going to get her some flowers because I love her too. All of a sudden, the flowers have meaning, and they're powerful. And the same is true with all this religious duty that we do. When it comes out of the context of, man, God loves me, and I want to say I love him back, so I'm going to do this stuff, it enriches the relationship. It gets better. It brings us tighter um, with God. It's doing the right stuff for the right reasons. Um, but it's really easy to just look at the exteriors. And Jesus works past that. And time and time again, he got so frustrated with the Pharisees because they did all the right things. They didn't do it for the right reasons. And he goes, you know, you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside's a mess because your hearts are so far from me. That relationship has gotten disconnected. 
At our core, we're spirit, and God wants for you to experience his love. He wants for you to know that you're loved, and he wants for you to be able to say, I love you back. And that can happen anywhere. It can happen at work. It can happen while you're making online. It can happen um, all through your week. It's easier here because we've got Richard up there leading a song that sing about him, and so it's easier to focus on that. It's easier because we're talking about Jesus a lot while we're here, but um, at the heart of this thing is a relationship with God. And if we lose track of that, we're going to lose track of the whole thing. <clears throat> we can do all the right actions and not get there. Here's how Jesus describes knowing him. Verse 13. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And that woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared to her, I, the one who's speaking to you right now, am you. This woman expected to crash into religion, and what she found was God, who says, I love you, I'm here for you, and I want to give you a gift. God isn't looking for a list of do's and don'ts. He's not looking for a checkbox of religion. He says, in the heat of the day, to a woman who needs water, I want to give you living water. What's the heat of the day for you? Do you want more of God? Are you thirsty for more out of life? Can you extend that offer to some other people who are thirsty for more out of life? That's what's at the heart of the gospel. Because what God wants to do is pour himself into every area of our lives so much so that we feel like a spring we're overflowing and we can't help but drift to everyone around us the fact that they are loved as well, that they are accepted, that God adores them. Whether or not they be great, whether or not they're not doing so great, God is absolutely in love with each of us. So, what if going into this week, we tried to study special attention to the fact that we're loved by God and then tried to share that love in some tangible way with some people that we came across. What if we did that this week and this month and this year? And what if that was the trademark of what Harvard Church or, frankly, any Christian is about? The love of God. That would be a beautiful thing. Let's pray. God, it's so easy to get distracted especially at this time when uh, there's all this kind of political stuff going on and, and Christians saying really stupid things sometimes that don't sound very much like you. Um, and Lord, we're stupid sometimes too. We get caught up in doing the right things. We get caught up in uh, having an us and a them. And what you really, really want for us to hear is that you love us. And what you really want us to say to somebody else is that you love them too and that you have something for them. Lord, help us to receive your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. Thanks for being in love with us. It makes it so much easier for us to say back to you, we love you.